Uh, my name is Sally Dean and I am um, Australia's Acting General Manager for ASEAN and today I'll be MC for this webinar which is focused on providing you, our audience, uh, with an update on the business landscape across the ASEAN region, how firms are being impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and where there might be opportunities to capitalise from the strong partnership between Australia and ASEAN. But before we start, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping matters. Firstly, everyone is on mute so we can avoid sound interruptions. Given the size of today's audience, um, we recommend you also turn off your video. I'd also like to uh, mention that we are recording today's webinar and plan to make it available on the Austrade website in the coming days. The form the format for today's event is that we will first hear from our four panellists and then move into a Q&A session with Minister Birmingham, answering questions that have been collected through the members of the 10 ASEAN bilateral business chambers. That means we won't be taking live questions from the audience today. However, if you do have a question or a comment you'd like to pose, you are most welcome to post them using the chat function and we will follow up with you directly after the session. Now, uh, we have been advised that uh, Minister Birmingham, who was to be our first speaker, is running uh, a little late. So I'd like to um, change the format and uh, ask our introduce our first speaker, who is going to be Chow Ta. Chow is Executive Director and Trans Transactional Counsel for SC Capital Partners Group with responsibility for transactions across Asia and Australia. She is currently a director of Auscham Vietnam and chair of Auscham ASEAN for 2020. As a qualified Australian lawyer and international, with the international and Vietnamese law experience, Chow also sits on a range of advisory committees, including the ASEAN Australia Education Dialogue, Australian Vietnamese Young Leadership Dialogue, and RMIT School of Business Management Industry Advisory Committee. Chow, over to you. Thank you. Chow, I think you're just on mute. You'll have to unmute yourself. Sorry, everyone. Thank you, Sally. Um, good morning, everybody. Firstly, my warmest greetings and thanks to the Honourable Minister Birmingham, our Australian Ambassador to ASEAN and patron of, uh, of Auschem ASEAN, Jane Duke, as well as Sally Dean, uh, for their team and their support of preparing this webinar. Guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, uh, a little bit about Auschem ASEAN. We were launched in 2017. Um, Auschem ASEAN is actually a chamber of chambers. Our nine foundation um, members are listed uh, in the next slide um, on your screen. If uh, someone can move the next slide for me. Ah, there you go. Um, that, as you can see there, uh, are our members and Brunei is pending to become the 10th member of Auschem RDN, with representing more than 2,000 Australian corporate members across the region. Our mission is informing Australian business on regional integration developments and the business landscape with a particular focus on the annual business survey, which I'll talk about shortly, explaining the contribution of Australian business to ASEAN markets and advocating the policies, rules and regulations that support Australian businesses activities in ASEAN, including organising sector roundtables in key areas of interest for Australian businesses. So um, going to the main part of uh, my presentation today is the outcome of the survey. So what we, what we do, as indicated earlier, is that we have um, carried out an annual Australian Business Survey in ASEAN for five years. So this webinar marks Auschem ASEAN's launch of our fifth report. This survey was actually originally scheduled to be launched in February, but a decision was taken to delay its launch and overlay a preliminary COVID-19 survey that we uh, had everybody under, undertook the, the survey early April, given the significant impact on global trade and business. 248 Australian businesses undertook the broader survey, while a larger than expected number of 333 Australian companies across RDN undertook the impact of COVID survey across just three days. 
So um, the results. Pre-COVID, had we published this survey in February, the results would have shown that Australian business sentiment with respect to RDN was buoyant, with continued confidence in RDN and a strong desire to expand their economic contribution to the region through increased trade and investment. More than 80% plan to expand their business and trade investment over the next five years. Perceptions of corruption remains the greatest challenge of operations in the region. Lack of access to skilled labor was cited by 36% of the firms, providing actually a very substantial opportunity for Australian firms to help to address this skills deficit. Almost four in every five of those surveyed believe that RDN was a priority region for their company. The, proportionate, the proportion of respondents who believe that RDN integration is important for doing business in the region continues to increase. This year, it's 47%, up from 41% in 2017. A majority of businesses continue to report needing further information on the progress and impact of the RDN econ economic community with only 10% really confidently can say they have a detailed understanding of what in RDN integration means to their business. Uh, also, fair enforcement of laws was viewed as a priority to acceleration of RDN integration, overtaken closely, um, followed by the reduction of investment and service restrictions. Um, and lastly, fixing infrastructure gaps across the region and improving labour mobility are one of the, um, the most important priorities for Australian business in RDN. However, with the advent of COVID-19, many businesses are in survival mode, as we all know and are experiencing. As revenues disappear, supply chains are closed down and the need to work remotely becomes mandatory across RDN and Australia. So unsurprisingly, post-COVID, 86% of firms in RDN anticipate that COVID-19 will have a negative impact on their business, and with almost a half expecting that the impact would be strongly negative. The three greatest impacts to date have been shown through this survey to be the loss of customers and revenues that have been have shown that has um, impacted due to the business environment. This is actually the single biggest negative factor. Business productivity when implementing working from home arrangements, 59% of businesses estimate that it has a negative impact on their business productivity. And lastly, the disruption of logistics and supply chains caused by the pandemic. As expected, and as you all know, the business climate across RDN will have continued to change since this survey was undertaken. And as such, Austin RDN plan to undertake a supplementary impact of COVID-19 survey towards the end of June, July. Um, this will provide important update information and will also be a great source of comparative data. So please watch out for it and participate in the survey as it will provide us great information. And um, if you want to know more about us, please reach out to us after this presentation. So thank you. Uh, Sally, back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Chow. Um, and I believe we have been joined by uh, Simon Birmingham. So welcome, Minister. Um, I'd like um, I'd like to introduce you as our next speaker. So uh, Simon Birmingham, as many of you would, all of you would know, is Australia's Trade, Tourism and Investment Minister. He has served as a Liberal Party Senator for South Australia since May 2007 and in August 2018 he was appointed as Australia's Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment as well as Deputy Leader of the Government in the Senate. Um, having had experience of working with Minister Birmingham's office in a previous life, I can attest to how hard he works in the interests of Australian business and helping them to succeed internationally. Um, I'd like to hand over to you now, Minister, for your remarks. Thanks, um, thanks very much, Sally, and uh, hello, everybody. And I'm trusting that uh, uh, we've got all the connections working now uh, appropriately, and my apologies for being a little late uh, in joining. Uh, um, but thank you very much for uh, for the commitment that so many are showing to the uh, Australia ASEAN relationship uh, by your engagement today, but of course by your activities 
on a day-to-day -day basis as, uh, as the uh, businesses, uh, leaders across fields of government and industry and commerce and society uh, who, uh, who drive and foster so much of this most crucial relationship uh, to us. Uh, so uh, Sally and Amelia at the Austrade team is on working with uh, uh, the Australian Chamber ASEAN and many country chambers who are participating today uh, to uh, Brenton, Chow, uh, to, uh, to our ASEAN Ambassador Jane Duke, fellow panellist Fraser, Look, thank you all for your participation in, in what is, I think, a very helpful and, uh, and useful opportunity to engage in some discussion, uh, albeit by uh, uh, less normal means using these virtual technologies at present, but about such a crucial period in time for, uh, for us all. And I start by extending best wishes to people across the uh, different countries uh, in what I know have been difficult times for, uh, for all and, uh, and acknowledge the, uh, the hard work and spirit of cooperation that many have had to show and a sacrifice in terms of uh, uh, giving up on normal activities and normal routines to uh, help ensure uh, the safety of people across countries uh, around our region. Countries and governments have been uh, racing to work out how to respond to a pandemic that none of us have lived through before in terms of uh, circumstances. And that has meant that uh, many have responded uh, in different ways and have had to adapt their responses uh, over a period of time. And businesses and private citizens have equally had to adapt and transition to this uh, strange new normal uh, that, uh, that we face. And for some, that's meant quite strict lockdowns, uh, obviously, for virtually all. It's meant that international travel has uh, ground to a halt uh, and that people have had to find, businesses have had to find innovative new ways to connect with customers and staff and clients. Uh, that, uh, that our international education sectors, for example, have had to model and change service delivery along with so many other parts of the services economy uh, to this type of virtual delivery and online engagement. And that uh, the challenges we are seeing now is that um, this pandemic is likely to lead to a faster uptake uh, in e-commerce and digital trade solutions uh, than would previously uh, have been the case. More and more businesses will switch to these types of digital delivery approaches. This year's Australian Business in ASEAN survey, which uh, I know you were just getting some more details on before, uh, has uh, reinforced that we must be uh, clear-eyed about the uh, approach of the virus uh, and we really do need to make sure uh, that uh, we support uh, businesses uh, in the way in which uh, they uh, continue to respond proactively. More than 85% of respondents have, of course, said uh, that the pandemic itself will have a negative impact on their business. That's unsurprising when so much activity is currently shut down uh, and disrupted. Uh, but uh, importantly, we must learn lessons from it and seize the opportunities uh, for uh, firm recovery uh, through learning, not just about online delivery and education and other services, but in e-health, um, and of course, continuing to ensure the flow of key goods across the market is, uh, is held up. Um, our governments recognise that the disruption to global aviation has had an immense and profound impact on many premium goods in their distribution throughout the region. That's why we provided support for a freight assistant mechanism uh, to make sure that uh, as passenger planes have stopped flying, uh, we can still get uh, cargo planes and freight um, out across the region uh, and ensure that those high value goods still get to market. And our ASEAN neighbours, uh, uh, being at the forefront of our thoughts on the health basis, are also very much at the forefront of our thoughts when it comes to the recovery as well. Uh, that we do recognise that uh, we will be in this together uh, in terms of recovery and making sure that the growth uh, of our economies uh, is one that we can all benefit from. Uh, our partnership, uh, Australia being ASEAN's longest standing dialogue partner, is one that we deeply value. The economic cooperation stands at the cornerstone of much of that partnership. Uh, the ASEAN, Australia, New Zealand free trade agreement being crucial. The scale of our two-way trade uh, valued in 2018-19 at some 
$124 billion between Australia and the ASEAN nations, or 14% uh, of Australia's total trade, demonstrates the extent of economic integration that is there, and we hope an extent that can only continue to grow and strengthen and solidify further thanks to the work and drive uh, of so many business partners. And we stand committed to further deepen those ties through the ASEAN partnerships that we have, such as the ANSFTA, our various bilateral agreements with Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, and the exciting entry into force on the 5th of July uh, of the Indonesia and Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership. We're determined to make sure that we push ahead uh, with the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, bringing together the ASEAN nations plus at least five other key regional economies uh, with Australia at the table. Uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully participating in a ministerial meeting of the 15 RCEP part parties who are committed to signing this year in the coming weeks, and where I hope we will issue a clear statement of our intent uh, to finalise and to sign that agreement this year, as we have committed to do so, that we won't let the pandemic stand in the way of doing so, and that we will then get on quickly with entry into force. And I hope that doing so will send a clear signal to business that despite some of the pressures on the global trading system, and despite some of the tensions in geopolitics, this region still stands committed to further opening up, to further integration, and to ensure that we seize the opportunities uh, that are going to be so important uh, to ensuring that our recovery is a successful recovery uh, across the board. We've been supporting Australian businesses to be able to survive through this crucial period. Not just with economy-wide measures in terms of uh, our support through what's known as the JobKeeper program, but also targeted measures for our international facing and export businesses, uh, such as financing support through Export Finance Australia. And for those businesses online who are uh, having challenges in terms of financing, I urge you uh, to reach out to EFA and to engage uh, in utilising those important solutions. I know that our missions across the region have been working hard as well to keep people connected. And this event is a crucial example of that. Uh, we see ASEAN as being even more important to the future of our regional economy, of regional stability, uh, and of close cooperation. We want to make sure that the recovery that we all desire is one that we all benefit from as well, uh, and that we help to drive that growth of economies, not just uh, our own, but of each of the 10 ASEAN partners, and from that, the others across our region. So thank you once again for engaging in, uh, in this platform. I know we've got a Q&A session to come where I look forward to touching on some of the issues that, uh, that uh, I know many of you have submitted uh, as questions today. Um, and please know as always that uh, my office, our department, our teams across DFAT and Austrade uh, are open for engagement with all of you at any time to make sure that we do make the most of the recovery that is to come and get it to deliver uh, the return of jobs and prosperity for our peoples as we need it. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much for those comments and we look forward to uh, hearing more from you in our Q&A session. I'd like to now introduce our third speaker, uh, Dr. Fraser Thompson. Fraser is the Managing Director and Founder of Alpha Beta, an economic strategy firm with headquartered, which is headquartered in Singapore, which aims to integrate economics and strategy to support for business and government decision making. Fraser has led a series of work in ASEAN, including the development of the ASEAN Connectivity Master Plan 2025, and has also served as the inaugural president of the Australian Chamber of Commerce in ASEAN. He is a senior advisor to IMA Asia and an executive director of Sun Cable. Given his background, I'm sure you'll agree, Fraser is well qualified to share his perspective on doing business across the ASEAN region. Thank you, Fraser. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Um, uh, thank you, Minister Birmingham, for your remarks as well. Um, looking forward to hearing the remarks of um, Ambassador Jane Duke uh, later as well. Um, I want to give some brief thoughts about what are the trends 
that are going to continue to have, um, um, be maintained in ASEAN and what are the trends that could shift um, post COVID. And, and I want to start off just with a few sort of numbers to put in perspective why ASEAN matters and the opportunity for Australia. I'm still of the belief that uh, ASEAN gets overlooked relative to its economic importance. And I think if that continues to happen, that would be a real, real shame. Uh, if you, if you just put the numbers, uh, look at the numbers alone, ASEAN's economy is roughly $2.9 trillion. Uh, that's the fifth largest economy in the world today and growing much faster than the other major blocks. Uh, it also is receiving about $150 billion of FDI a year, which is more than India, and is almost comparable with that going into China. So it's, it's a major economic powerhouse, and it's got a set of tailwinds that are really uh, set to propel future growth. And I think it's great to see that Australia is building its engagement in the region. Uh, the trade flows are increasing. If you look at our share of FDI that's going into this region, um, it's, it's more than tripled um, since 2001. And those are really encouraging signs. And so I hope we can continue this momentum. So I want to touch on just a few trends uh, on the next slide that I think are going to continue um, to be important and for businesses to take note of. And then I also want to share some that may shift post COVID. So if we look at some of the trends shaping the region on this slide, one of the big ones, and one we don't talk about enough, but it is the single most important driver of economic growth, uh, and that is urbanisation. Uh, this is a, a region that is actually relatively late to the game in urbanisation. Uh, only about half of people in ASEAN live in cities, uh, compared to over 80% in Latin America. Uh, but that's changing very quickly. Uh, and even by 2025, 70 million more people are expected to move to cities in ASEAN. And the really interesting aspect of this is that they're not so much moving to the mega cities of the Jakartas, the Manilas, the Bangkoks anymore. They're increasingly moving to these middleweight regions uh, between sort of half a million and five million people. Uh, and these are really going to be the growth centres going forward and, and important for Australian business to engage in. Uh, the second is around progress on connectivity. I think it was terrific on the survey to see that almost half of Australian business um, think ASEAN integration is really important for how they do business in the region. Um, and this acceleration on connectivity across the region is going to be really powerful for integrating these 10 countries into one economic block. Uh, the third is around digital technologies, and we could talk a, a lot about this, um, but the numbers here are huge. $625 billion potential in ASEAN by 2030. Uh, some of the numbers associated with that, um, ASEAN is the second biggest Facebook market in the world. Uh, Jakarta is the Twitter capital um, of the world. So it's a, it's a region that loves technology and it's a consuming class that is growing and where technology such as big data uh, and Internet of Things are really important for understanding these changing trends. Uh, there's also challenges though. Um, one is around inequality. We see that only 50% of uh, people in ASEAN are financially included. So for businesses, that means often new cash delivery models to tap into this consuming class. Uh, there's challenges with all of us know who live in the region around congestion. Uh, from an economic standpoint, that matters. 5% of GDP is lost in, in, in countries in ASEAN um, because of congestion. Uh, then we have issues around energy transition. You know, IEA has recently come out and said ASEAN is the only region in the world where their forecast is for the coal to potentially increase its share of the energy mix um, going into 2030. Um, but on the upside, there's incredibly exciting opportunities around the integration of the energy grid. Um, a company that I'm on the board of, Sun Cable, is actually planning to export uh, renewable energy from Northern Territory into ASEAN, linking into this ASEAN power grid, um, which is an exciting opportunity for Australian business. Um, rule of law, increasingly challenging, moving into cyber security issues, and, and Australia is really at the forefront of government to government engagement on this topic. Uh, and then finally, non-communicable diseases. Uh, so we're having, seeing a three times rise in the rate of obesity um, in, in ASEAN, partly reflecting this urbanisation and increased affluence. So these are just some of the trends that I think will be important for businesses to have on their radar that are going to be maintained um, in this post-COVID world. I wanted to share on the next slide a few things I think may change and it is worth us keeping on our radar. The first is around this increasing shift towards the nation state. Um, we, we live in a very different world now, and I think it's, it's fair to say that even after the, the pandemic, things will not go back to 
uh, normal in, in the way of businesses' relationships with governments and particularly in the region. Uh, we've seen pieces of this, you know, Vietnam um, temporarily banned the export of rice, uh, but we've seen increasing concerns with uh, countries in the region ab about whether it's food security to other concerns as they try to rebuild their economies. This also could be a real positive for the region, by the way. Um, part of the geopolitical tensions between China and other parts of the world is seeing increasing FDI flows into the region. Uh, Vietnam is one particular beneficiary of that. Uh, the second opportunity is around data-enabled healthcare, and it was great to see the minister to talk about that as a potential opportunity. This, is, this was a huge opportunity even before COVID, um, mainly because we have such a limited reach of healthcare services and such a huge need to make more efficient spend of, of the healthcare spend that we do have. Uh, just to put one stat into, um, to help put this into context, uh, ASEAN only has 0 0.6 physicians per 1,000 people. Uh, the WHO says that rate should increase 8x versus where it is today. So there's a huge shortage of qualified staff. So technologies such as telemedicine, remote patient monitoring are gonna be crucial to, to filling that healthcare gap. Um, and Australia is well-placed given our, our health tech um, leadership. Um, third is around accelerated automation. Manual tasks have uh, increasingly been automated, but COVID has seen that, that trend accelerated. Uh, one um, executive that I spoke to recently basically described it as um, three years progress on automation, um, it, which has happened in, the, in two months time. Uh, and we've seen this after every economic crisis, a shift to more automation of, of tasks. Uh, and so this is gonna change very much the social contract between a lot of businesses and governments. Uh, the fourth is around supply chains. Uh, I think the good news is that supply chains held up relatively well in ASEAN despite the pressures, um, but supply chains in this region, is, as many of the businesses who have operated here for a while will know, uh, are still incredibly inefficient in many regards. Um, three quarters of retail distribution channels are still traditional format. There's a huge amount of wastage out of stock um, loss uh, uh, happening across the different supply chains. And so a range of different technologies such as Internet of Things has huge potential to have better control of these supply chains and minimize those losses. Uh, and then the, the last thing I mentioned, just the shifting consumer behavior. Um, after the 1918 um, pandemic, there was actually a huge shift in the way that consumers engaged um, even after the pandemic. And it'll be interesting to note, what are those shifts we're gonna see in consumer behavior um, from what we've seen pre-crisis? Uh, that could be, for example, more willingness to do things online um, and rather than face-to-face -face interaction. So hopefully that gives you a bit of sort of flavor of some of the trends um, that we're seeing. Just wanted to finish off with just three implications I think useful to take note of for business. Number one, um, don't ignore the middleweights. These cities, these growing cities are gonna be hugely important for the, the growth in the region and a real opportunity for Australian business to tap into. Uh, number two, engage with ASEAN. I think bodies like Ostcham ASEAN are incredibly important as well as the, um, the re various regional chambers um, can really help shape the discussion and the regulatory environment in a really positive way. Um, and third, I think for all businesses, we're gonna to have to sharpen our post-COVID narrative, um, make it clear to the ASEAN leaders and ASEAN um, government officials um, why they should care about our business, how we're helping to address some of those broader concerns they're facing. So I'll stop there. Thanks for your time and looking forward to, to seeing the discussion that will follow. Terrific. Thank you very much, Fraser, for sharing those insights, particularly around the trends we can expect to be with us for some time. Uh, our final speaker today before we move into the Q&A session is Jane Duke, Australia's Ambassador to ASEAN. Jane is a career officer with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. She has served previously as Deputy High Commissioner to Malaysia and as Council Immigration at Australia's Permanent Mission to the United Nations in Geneva. She's also served as the Assistant Secretary of DFAT Southeast Asia Regional Branch, Canada and Latin America Branch and Northern Southern Eastern Europe Branch. Jane's going to outline for us how Australia is engaging ASEAN on the pandemic uh, response. Thank you, Jane, over to you. Thanks very much, Sally, for that introduction and good morning, everyone. Minister Chow, Fraser, thanks very much for your remarks uh, that you have delivered this morning. I have been delighted to have served as Australia's ambassador to ASEAN over these past four years. 
and as AUSCHAM ASEAN patrons since its official launch in 2017. The work of AUSCHAM ASEAN and the bilateral chambers is vital to understanding the Australian business environment in the region. And I particularly value the insights provided by AUSCHAM ASEAN's annual survey and its timely COVID-19 update this year. As outlined by the Minister and other speakers, COVID-19 is having an unprecedented impact on health systems, on economies, and on the welfare of the nearly 650 million people who live in the ASEAN region. And thank you, Fraser, for your analysis of the trends post-COVID that are likely to continue that impact on this environment and your recommendations on how businesses might respond. Because Australia and ASEAN are critical partners at this time of crisis. And our long-standing and close cooperation and strong people-to-people -people ties position our governments, our businesses and communities well to contribute to the economic recovery of our neighbourhood. ASEAN ministers and leaders have acted to protect trade and investment flows, regional value chains, employment and business from the impacts of COVID-19. At the special ASEAN summit on COVID-19 on 14 April, ASEAN leaders agreed to measures to sustain regional integration, to promote economic recovery, and including a renewed commitment to completing the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, this year that the Minister spoke about. ASEAN economic ministers have also made commitments to leverage technologies and digital trade to allow businesses to continue training, to strengthen supply chain resilience and sustainability, and enhance ASEAN's economic cooperation with external partners. And again, as the Minister said, Australia is ASEAN's oldest external partner and we will continue our cooperation to promote an open, stable and prosperous region. We held our annual officials level annual ASEAN Australia Forum by video conference on the 18th of May. And our work on deeper economic integration is a key pillar of our engagement. We discussed how we might support ASEAN's economic recovery. We are leveraging a long-standing development cooperation program with ASEAN to improve the capacity for digital trade, to strengthen competition laws and policies, and enhance intellectual property frameworks. We're helping ASEAN look forward, including by supporting the region take advantage of the fourth industrial revolution and improve regional logistics. Again, as the Minister outlined, RCEP provides an opportunity to shape the future of economic architecture in this region, and the planned upgrade of ANSVITA is another top priority. The Australian mission to ASEAN is committed to working with the Australian business in the region as we navigate the uncertain waters ahead. We look forward to supporting upcoming engagements by Australia's Foreign Minister Payne, by Minister Birmingham, and by the Prime Minister with their ASEAN counterparts in the months ahead. Much can be done virtually, even if it can't be done face to face, and we can work together through this crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And um, can I say thank you to all our speakers? So, um, and we are uh, dead on time. We've allowed about 20 minutes uh, for the rest of the session. And during, we're now going to take the opportunity to direct some questions to you, Minister, um, from your panellists. And uh, those questions have come through from members of the 10 ASEAN bilateral chambers. Um, I, I should acknowledge that we did receive quite a few questions, so unfortunately we're not going to have time to get through them all. However, there were some common themes that came through, so where we have been able to, we've grouped them up. Um, and so uh, I'm going to start with the first question, which has come through from our Malaysia colleagues, um, and it reads as, um, in Malaysia, uh, our colleagues are missing bigger cheese and fresh Aussie beef, and wonder if it is likely the international freight assistance mechanism will be extended either in terms of budget, time, or geographic coverage. Over to you. I think you just need to unmute yourself. Yeah, unmute might be helpful. We're good now? Excellent, look at that. We've got audio and pictures all working, uh, finally. So my apologies there. I, 
I could joke that I had to you know, finish putting the suit on before I turned the camera on, but uh, that wouldn't quite be true. But um, <laughs> apologies for the technical difficulties earlier. Um, uh, to uh, to our um, Malaysian colleagues, you know, I did notice uh, the other week a um, uh, wonderful High Commissioner there, Andrew, uh, posted quite a sensational uh, video uh, of himself in the supermarket uh, uh, filling his trolley full of Australian produce, or importantly, produce where Australian goods were part of the supply chain and part of the value chain there, and uh, highlighting and where are wheat going into noodles and, uh, and that cooperation and integration that exists uh, uh, across the region and, uh, and that's so crucial. Um, IFAM, our Freight Adjustment uh, Resistance Mechanism, which, uh, which I referenced in my remarks before, has been an important part of our response. It, uh, it has been uh, enabling Australian suppliers premium goods to, uh, to get their product uh, to market uh, across the region and to, uh, to recognise that, uh, that without passenger planes flying, there are real gaps in terms of, uh, of access points. Um, it has its constraints in terms of uh, the viability of certain routes and, uh, and we have to balance the, the cost of which routes we're supporting there because we're not giving exporters a free ride. They're still having to pay for their goods to get to market and to pay a premium to do so. But we're helping with the logistics and at least ensuring that, uh, that the fact that planes are flying without passengers, uh, they can still fly at an economic rate for both the airlines and for the, uh, the exporters. It's continually uh, under review, both in terms of its ongoing operations post the, uh, the initial budget period for it and where the demand sits in terms of different routes and so on. And I'd love to see uh, us be able to get something uh, into KL and to expand the footprint uh, across the region. But of course, we also just have to keep working on the traditional hub and spoke model too. So, uh, so in some cases it will just be the case that goods will have to move through other ports uh, that, uh, that operate as a hub before they can get there. But hopefully, fingers crossed, we can get some progress on that one. Thank you, Minister. I've got a question for you. Sorry to jump in. Um, Minister, for many years, um, Australian businesses has been very focused on North Asia. Comparatively, ASEAN has not received the same level of um, investment and thus trade has not reached its full potential. Um, we're interested in your thoughts on how government can assist, uh, promote or otherwise support enhanced investment, trade and tourism with ASEAN beyond what's already been done in the past. Thanks and uh, I think um, the pivot in a sense, if, uh, if there is one, was, uh, was already underway. Certainly, if not a pivot then, definitely an expansion of focus and attention and activity uh, looking at uh, the ASEAN economies. Uh, we, uh, in concluding uh, that uh, FTA with Indonesia, uh, in getting to the point of signing RCEP, uh, in structuring our trade missions for which, and sadly, they haven't been able to go ahead, but we were looking at, uh, at uh, making sure that we had trade missions heading out uh, to Vietnam, to Malaysia and to Indonesia uh, in, the, uh, in the first part of this year and to giving them real prominence is a recognition that, uh, that the ASEAN economies are on strong growth curves and we want to see that continue because that is uh, delivering prosperity and opportunity for the people across those countries and yes, trade opportunities for Australia. I'm very focused in all of these relationships as to how we get investment flowing uh, as well, that, uh, that the investment dividend uh, for ASEAN countries of having Australian super funds and other Australian investors look at the opportunities there are, uh, how we maximise the dual benefits of uh, closer economic relations. And so, uh, yes, I think it's a, it's a fair point that perhaps with the finalisation a few years back of the FTAs with the big North Asian economies of uh, uh, Japan, ROK and uh, China, and that provided a, a focus on opportunities there at, uh, at that time. But now uh, we're in a similar uh, wave closer to home with the ASEAN economies. And, uh, and I think Fraser in, uh, in his remarks spoke uh, enthusiastically about some of the emerging opportunities that will exist there as well. And, uh, and the very exciting concepts as to, uh, as to whether new energy projects uh, can provide even closer ties uh, between Australia uh, and the ASEAN economies in terms of our capacity and potential in renewable energy, in emerging hydrogen supplies and clean fuels to, uh, 
help economies that are rapidly growing have skipped some of the stages that others have gone through and, and transitioned quickly into some of those, uh, those new areas of uh, potential, just as the e-commerce and digital platform needs to provide new opportunities in fields like healthcare and education and so on for closer collaboration. And, uh, and I hope that we really can cement all of those ties and that, uh, uh, and that the, the legal signing of RCEP will also be a big symbolic leap forward and then the opportunity for us to renew uh, our ties and under uh, under the Antarctic agreement are important as well. Thank you, Minister. Minister, um, if, if I could ask a question as well that's come from some of our um, participants, uh, and, and that is about um, regulatory reform. So for a lot of businesses who operate in the region, we tend to focus in the specific countries in which we operate to, to tackle issues that we may face. Uh, but do you think there's a case for us to also engage at the ASEAN level to address some of those regulatory issues? Um, and what role can business do to better support the efforts of the government is, ha is having in, in a number of these free trade agreements that, that you mentioned earlier? Thanks, Fraser. I think um, you know, recognising that trade is not just about uh, tariffs and quotas and, uh, and the traditional trade barriers, uh, but it's about always the ease of doing business as well as the competitiveness uh, um, of, uh, of products and prices is, uh, is such an important uh, thing for us to, uh, to understand. Now, um, at different levels, uh, I think our discussions with ASEAN partners are taking really positive forward steps. The Indonesia agreement um, has uh, processes built in place for the consideration of non-tariff barriers, uh, and that's uh, a really important uh, step and, uh, and very much a, a first in terms of uh, the way in which our FTAs are structured and hopefully can enable us to have an ongoing dialogue with vehicle to iron out some of those regulatory hurdles that, uh, that in terms of licensing and approvals and so on can get in the way uh, even when tariffs have been, have been stripped away. Uh, in a more forward-looking sense, um, the recent digital economy agreement that, uh, that we've finalised with Singapore uh, is providing for common platforms around uh, e-invoicing and, uh, and uh, e-payments and, uh, and potentially the uh, use of digital identifications and technologies in other ways which can bring us forward into more effective, faster, streamlined processes that, uh, that are so uh, crucial there. And, and I think uh, region-wide agreements are also providing the basis for similar gains uh, to be made and uh, where we can harmonise um, uh, the mutual recognition of uh, standards, particularly in terms of standards around qualifications and employment rights, uh, so crucial to, uh, to the services sector in particular. Um, you know, they're important breakthroughs for us to, uh, to make. And, uh, and domestically within Australia, we're now having the discussion about how do we get on with reform to things like our vocational and education training system to make sure that um, Australians can better navigate the system but also hopefully to make sure that, uh, that it can more effectively engage in offering skills training uh, to the region, which is, uh, which is so important. Uh, how do we make sure that other aspects of red tape and, and business practice in Australia are streamlined, that a uh, uh, pandemic like this has to shake us all out of our comfort zones in a sense and think again about uh, how we make the ease of doing business as, uh, as, um, as positive as it can be and so that we can get the jobs growth back that we all need. Thank you, Minister. I have another question that has been passed from uh, the Chambers for you this morning, and that is whether Australian trade policies align with those of our ASEAN partners. Thanks, um, uh, thanks Jane. I think increasingly um, uh, they are, and uh, I was, uh, was thrilled last year uh, together with uh, my New Zealand colleague for us to convene um, a meeting of the ASEAN uh, trade ministers uh, to talk about cooperation through the World Trade Organization and cooperation on issues of uh, WTO reform. And that was uh, really a, a first in our region for us to sort of move beyond um, the areas of regional cooperation and talk about how as a region together we can take uh, common positions and common platforms to uh, to those global discussions, and, uh, and I'm eager for us to continue to build on that. Of course, we have uh, different interests, and different structures, and uh, and we're not always going to uh, 
uh, agree uh, on those points. But uh, but I think um, the finalisation of, of RCEP is a demonstration that uh, at a broad level, we do recognise uh, the importance of continuing to open up uh, and integrate uh, with one another. Uh, the cooperation directly between ASEAN economies in Australia is a recognition that um, that type of cooperation can enhance the sovereignty of each other and the strength of each other. And through that economic strength, of course, comes the ability to, uh, to both deliver better services for, uh, for people as well as to enhance the, uh, uh, the, uh, the capacity of countries to, uh, to withstand uh, shocks or, uh, or disruptions along the way. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm confident that we continue to track in, uh, in the right direction there and some of the other things I referenced in response to Fraser's question I think highlight that. It's not, uh, not a case that we will always be at one on everything, um, but certainly a case of the increased dialogue and uh, commitment across the region is one that I think empowers us to, uh, to get better outcomes globally. Uh, Minister, it's Chow again. I have another question for you. Um, when Australia eases its travel restrictions, and I think a lot of businessmen and women are interested to know, do you think it's likely that business travellers would be one of the first groups um, to be allowed to travel in and out of Australia? Um, could APEC business card holders uh, be considered as one of those groups, given that they've been pre-screened uh, for short-term business travel? How do you see that um, coming along? Thanks, Chow. Uh, as, as the Trade and Tourism and Investment Minister, uh, and one of the most painful things for me to see uh, um, outside of the health crisis has been this uh, elimination of uh, a free flow of people and, uh, and travel, because uh, for all platforms like this are uh, helpful and probably will be increasingly utilised now for communication. Nothing still beats that uh, that enhancement of people to people ties that can give us better cultural understanding uh, and enable us to, uh, to then more effectively see the business and the commerce opportunities and the chances to, uh, to deepen those ties. And, uh, uh, and of course, it is disappointing that, uh, that that is off the agenda for now. But it's going to be a very cautious uh, process, I suspect, to reopening those international borders. Uh, Australia has enjoyed remarkable success in suppressing the spread of COVID-19, um, and, uh, and our international border approaches has been a, have been a key part of that. And there may be opportunities for us to slowly open up in terms of travel with certain countries, but I think a parallel track to that will be the possibility for certain categories of, uh, of visitors to, uh, to re-enter Australia. Most likely, the, the most visible categories initially are going to be those on longer stay uh, trips, because I think the model that we've been applying to Australians returning to Australia over recent months is a mandatory 14-day quarantine uh, period. And that's worked incredibly well. It's identified people who are positive and enabled us to, uh, to handle them in ways without exposing the rest of the population to the possible spread of COVID. And so if I look at where opportunities may open up for us to allow travel from the region, it's first and foremost more likely to be in those categories of long stay visitors. So those coming in to, uh, to manage businesses and investments uh, or undertake highly skilled jobs or undertake study for longer periods of time where a 14-day quarantine is feasible, um, that's something that perhaps we can start to facilitate at some point along the same type of model as we've deployed for returning Australian travellers. Um, perhaps then there's scope for us to look at, uh, at APEC card holders or, or similar types of, uh, of reciprocal arrangements as we move through further stages. But I, uh, it will be uh, a, an unfortunately frustrating and slow process, I in terms of reopening uh, the borders, and we're going to have to keep engaging like this to keep the lines of communication open. Um, uh, but uh, ultimately, there'll be a breakthrough. I'm a positive person. I think we will see uh, that vaccine come through at some point, and, uh, and I think we will also hopefully see some global cooperation around the sharing, the manufacturing, and the distribution to make sure that we can all get back to more normal um, engagement uh, as quickly as possible. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister, we, we had a, a number of um, participants ask questions about the air freight and, and tourism flights between Australia and the region. 
And, um, and thank you earlier for referring to this and the, the, the great support the Australian government's given in this area. Uh, the question uh, that people had was, how do you see this support going forward in terms of um, air freight to increase the frequency and the, the cost support um, to getting Australian goods into, into the region? Um, and is there any indication of when we may see an increase in, in the, the tourism flight connections between um, Australia and the region? Thanks, Fraser. Um, I think uh, it's, a, it's a fine balancing act we're trying to engage in here when it comes to the uh, air freight uh, assistance mechanism. It is uh, in wanting to provide the support to make sure the linkages remain uh, and that, uh, and that our uh, producers are not completely cut off. Uh, and importantly, you know, where we can, we're using the backhaul, the flights coming into Australia uh, for medical supplies, but over time, uh, we're very open to other premium, high-value uh, goods uh, that make sense to uh, to fly on aircraft to be coming back the other way. This is uh, this is not about uh, purely an export strategy. It's about recognising that, uh, that we're facilitating the air movement for trade to occur and for trade to occur in two-way terms in a sense. Um, but the careful balance is that we don't want to destroy the commercial incentive for aviation to come back in a normal way too. And, uh, and at some stage, we want to get government out of running this program uh, and for uh, commercial aviation operators to, uh, to stand up uh, facilities on their own. But so long as the international travel restrictions remain in place, there's probably going to be a need for something like IFAM. Uh, and so I can see us continuing to have to uh, support that in some way. Uh, we've seen you know, remarkable success now. I think it's, uh, it's well over a thousand flights that have been scheduled, uh, uh, carrying more than $700 million worth of premium exports uh, out of Australia under present estimates and, and more to come. And, uh, and so I, uh, that's been warmly recognised by government, warmly received by industry, and we just know we'll have to, uh, to keep working on that model. But it's also going to have to be one where we allow for the tapering off as it stops happening when we get commercial flights coming back in, uh, in a genuine way. Um, in terms of passengers, obviously the answer to, to Charles' question before is relevant there as to what type of passengers we can see. But I would like to think that perhaps in future iterations of IFAM, there might be room for us to put some bodies in the seats on those aircraft uh, as well as cargo underneath. Um, and they might be very limited and they might be under the type of terms that I just discussed before of, uh, of quarantining and otherwise, but at least getting some movement happening again uh, under those very safe terms that I think we've already proven we can handle uh, in terms of uh, the repatriation of Australians. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Minister. And I've got another question from business uh, that you've really already touched on in your remarks and answers to some other questions. But business is interested in hearing from you about what financial support and incentives is available for Australians and Australian businesses that are based overseas. Thanks. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, Shane. So um, the uh, support we've provided through additional funding into, uh, into the export market development grants, I know, has, uh, has provided uh, a bit of buffer and support for many Australian businesses um, who have operations overseas and, uh, and pursuing different uh, export uh, growth strategies in, in markets. And I should also remind everyone who we were going through a, a review of the EMDG uh, and that review has completed and I've got the report and we are working through um, now looking at that in the context of the changed environment that, uh, that we've got and, uh, and what that means for how we take EMDG reform forward and, uh, and other factors. But, uh, but we, you know, we made that decision to increase the funding this year knowing that many uh, exporters who invested uh, would have done their dough, to you know, sort of put it bluntly, um, and so, uh, so we're giving that extra payout factor there, as well as changing some of the technical terms to uh, make it easier for people to, uh, to qualify um, uh, at uh, this point in time. The Export Finance Australia assistance of uh, $500 million, crucial uh, again in terms of providing financing solutions for those uh, with uh, internationally facing operations, knowing that it's often harder to convince financial institutions as to how they test the risk uh, of doing business overseas and, uh, and engagement there. 
I also say sort of more generally you know, that we are very focused in the rebuild strategy on how we brand, how we position Australia, what our reputation looks like coming out of uh, this crisis and, uh, uh, and uh, of course, uh, our successful management of it here, I think, speaks to and reinforces the safety and the reliability uh, of Australia and the quality of the way in which we, uh, we tackle things, um, uh, but also uh, the way in which we try to reach out and provide assistance and engagement around the world. And even things like IFAM, yes, they're helping our exporters, uh, but they're also demonstrating that even in times of crisis, we can be relied upon uh, to honour our contracts, to deliver uh, goods where we possibly can, uh, and to sort of keep that connection with, uh, with market. They're important demonstrations for us to, uh, to build upon and carry into the future. Thank you, Minister. Um, we only have a minute left, uh, so unfortunately we've run out of time. So it is time to conclude today's webinar. Um, on your screens, hopefully uh, you'll see a slide shortly and it will provide the websites uh, for where for further information for the programs mentioned by Minister Birmingham today, you can go to and access more information. Also a reminder that we have recorded today's webinar and we'll post it on the Austrade website in the coming days. On behalf of all our panellists, can I take the opportunity to thank everyone for joining us today. We know it's a busy time for everyone, so we appreciate uh, the time you've taken to join us. And finally, can I thank uh, our panellists and speakers today, Minister Birmingham, Chow Ta, Dr Fraser Thompson and Jane Duke. And on that note, that concludes today's event. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, everyone.